Hello. So today I would like to talk about a subject which I have come literally in the last week or few days to be really absorbed with and believe it's possibly one of the most important topics for me at the moment and indeed may well be something that others um, in the trans community, but not only in the trans community, really thinking about everyone <laughs> in general would do well perhaps to reflect on a particular theory. And this is on the subject of unconscious sex, a term that I hadn't really even, I don't think, come across until quite recently, although it's been around for many years now. I was pointed to this through a, um, um, a thread in the Crossdream, uh, Crossdreamers, uh, Crossdream Life, I should say, forum, which pointed to an amazing article. I thought a really, really thoughtful article in Medium by um, a trans man, Paul John Poles, entitled, Why Isn't Anyone Talking About Subconscious Sex? And he went on to say that subconscious sex was really a missing piece in um, his own jigsaw puzzle, his own gender jigsaw puzzle. And having read his article and having gone on actually to read a book that I've been meaning to read for a long while, it's a classic in the trans uh, discourse, Whipping Girl by the biologist and trans activist uh, Julia Serrano. I, I've actually come to reflect on this same question. This is something perhaps that by not being aware of it um, has caused me a lot of confu confusion. So this term, um, subconscious sex, was coined by Julia Serrano, um, and she defined it as an unconscious and inexplicable self-understanding regarding what sex one belongs to or should be. She says that it's a blind spot that most people have, not just in the trans world, but particularly actually probably more so among so-called uh, cissexual people, i.e. those who do not have um, any um, dissonance in, in, in their identity and their, their felt lived experience. Um, but of course, it's also a blind spot for many, probably in the trans community, who've never come across the idea or thought about it. This is something that's only likely, perhaps, to come to the fore when we do experience dissonance uh, between the sex we believe we should be and the body we inhabit. inhabit. Now, um, both Poles and Serrano uh, are at pains to point out some definitions here, uh, which are quite important to make sense of this. Now, Paul suggests that this idea of a subconscious sex differs to the idea of a gender inclination, um, and also from the idea of gender identity, which he respectively define as, in the case of gender inclination, a person's tendency, usually experienced as innate and persistent, to align with a certain gender. Uh, defining gender here as the set of social roles, expectations, behaviors, and so on, commonly associated with a given sex, or their tendency to move away from gender as it exists today through a rejection of gender and or uh, through a creative reinvention of gender. And in the case of um, gender identity, polls defines that as someone's gender inclination, which has risen to the level of their conscious awareness as expressed through a word or a set of words, uh, which they feel best communicates the said gender inclination. And he gives examples such as gender queer, femme, butch, uh, and so on. Now, he also suggests that we distinguish sex identity which he defines as a person's subconscious sex, which has risen to the level of their conscious awareness as expressed through a word or a set of words, which they feel best communicates the said subconscious sex, giving examples, male, female, man, woman, uh, neutral. Birth sex, this being a person's physical sex at birth, for example, male, female, or intersex. Their lift sex, 
a person's current physical sex, gender expression, the external manifestation of one's intrinsic gender inclination and or gender identity and or desire to conform with a particular gender for whatever reason, and also lived identity, which encompasses the various aspects of one's gender and sex with respect to how one relates to them and relates to others through them as expressed through a word or words, which one feels best communicates them. Also, this can be referred to as our lived gender and sexed identities or lived gender sex identity. Examples given here, gender queer man, femme, neutral, among others. So really making an important distinction here between gender and sex, between what we are living, what we um, actually perceive, what our subconscious or indeed conscious perception of ourselves is, um, and how we express I, our identity. Now, on the basis that it could lead people to uh, conflate subconscious sex with the tendency to be either feminine, masculine, or something in between, Poles doesn't use um, the term gender inclinations in the same broad way that Julia Serrano does, where she says this covers our subconscious sex, gender expression, and sexual orientation, all different things. But rather, Poles relates to gender inclination to what Serrano calls gender expression. So you do need to read the articles and dwell on them a little bit uh, on these definitions to begin to appreciate, I think, why there are clear distinctions to be made between these. And this is really one of the main arguments that both of these authors put forward. Poles makes the point that sex and gender specifically are separate inclinations. And that is not always the case, as he put it, puts it, that trans people change our sex in order to affirm our gender, but rather they do so in order to affirm our subconscious sex. And we change our gender expression in order to affirm our gender inclination. In other words, one thing follows another. And this is where we, I think we can get very confused um, if we are very much focused on kind of the, the end point of um, this manifestation of something that starts as a subconscious knowing, for want of a better word. And uh, it gets mixed up with social ideas, uh, so the so-called social constructs around gender, how we should conform, plus our own fears and so on about um, how brave we are <laughs> in wanting to do that, how ready we are, or indeed, uh, for, for some people, it's it's something that they feel very empowering to be non-conforming. This word inclination um, in Serrano's definition, uh, she uses as a catch-all phrase to describe any persistent desire, affinity, or urge that predisposes us towards particular gender and sexual expressions and experiences. Now, specifically relating to gender, um, Poles observes that the word identity is ambiguous, pointing to the notion of identifying as something. And he asks, does it denote the deliberate act of assigning a specific label to oneself and purporting to become the thing the label refers to through that act? Or is it the conscious acknowledgement of an existing fact about oneself? In other words, is it something really that's authentic or socially created, made up in order for us to live the life that we, we feel we want to live? The word gender, as in gender identity, he says, is used indiscriminately to refer to subconscious sex and gender inclination. And because of this, it actually invalidates those who are gender non-conforming and who don't align with the rigid um, expectations, or at least move towards the rigid expectation, expectations of uh, binary, as it were, what is expected of a man and a woman, and how they should present and be in society. So he says, for example, someone could identify as being a butch trans woman, 
a masculine trans woman, and as is the case that he describes for himself, a feminine trans man. He had the urge, the need, the desire, um, the awareness that his sex, um, his subconscious sex, was not aligned with the body he was born into, a female body, but in terms of his gender expression, um, perhaps, and indeed it may, it may, it may also extend to sexual orientation, again, something separate, um, uh, he, he doesn't conform to what would be described perhaps as this um, binary idea of what a man should be. Serrano too struggles with the term gender identity, saying that with regard to transsexuals, the phrase is problematic because it seems to describe two potentially different things, the gender we consciously choose to identify as and the gender we subconsciously feel ourselves to be. It's the second of these that she calls our subconscious sex, going on to say, perhaps the best way to describe how my subconscious sex feels to me is to say that it seems as if, on some level, my brain expects my body to be female. She says that she uses the word sex rather than gender, since, in her own experience, she's felt this as being rather exclusively about her physical sex, and because for her, this subconscious desire to be a female has, has existed independently of the social phenomena uh, commonly associated with the word gender. For example, she had no early desire to explore female gender roles or to express femininity, and believing that her gender identity, or the way she consciously relates to her, her gender, has been very much shaped by uh, cultural norms and her own personal beliefs and experiences. And then she goes on to conclude that my female subconscious sex had nothing to do with gender roles, femininity, or sexual expression. It was about the personal relationship I had with my body. So this brings us back to kind of a, a biological or, or, or perhaps something deep within the, the psyche or something that is deeply innate, uh, a little bit like a switch that tells an organism uh, to be um, as it is. Uh, I, I, I'm very much drawn to the idea of Rupert Sheldrake, famous biologist theory of morphic resonance here, the idea that there is something quite invisible. We might call it an archetype, um, a footprint, if you like, that tells a species how to grow, how to be. And perhaps it's the same, because essentially there is a switch that says you are male or you are female sex in this case being quite clearly one or the other, whereas gender is uh, clearly something that <laughs> spans a spectrum perhaps. And as, as we know, sexual orientation as well um, takes many various forms. So Anna goes on, each of us has a unique experience with gender, one that is influenced by a host of extrinsic factors, such as culture, religion, race, economic class, upbringing, and ability, as well as intrinsic factors, including our anatomy, genetic, and hormonal makeup, subconscious sex, sexual orientation, and gender expression. Together, these factors help determine the gendered experiences we are exposed to, as well as the ways we process and make sense of them. For this reason, no person is capable of fully understanding our own gender perspectives and experiences, nor are we able to presume the gender histories, desires, motives, and perceptions of others. Or, as she goes on um, quite strongly to argue, to, for anyone to impose ideas about what should be uh, the way to behave, to act, what is normal um, based on their own experience. Um, this is clearly, uh, just looking at that list she mentions there, something that is very complex. I found this very important to contemplate. I've spent quite a lot of time in recent days reflecting on it, particularly how I personally relate to it as a person who um, identifies as gender fluid. In other words, who is, is very focused on gender um, play and gender expression. And it's really brought me back to this question, what is 
my subconscious sex? Can I actually get to the bottom of what that's about? And maybe that says something about others who consider themselves to be gender fluid, or we might say sex fluid. Um, uh, that could uh, opens up the discussion around orientation, so might bring uh, the idea of bisexuality or asexuality into the equation. It also brings into question perhaps the idea about androgyny or intersex. Perhaps it isn't quite as straightforward as being able to switch one way or the other. But I'm processing all of this at the moment, and I think it's going to take a little time. I will come back at some point. It may be, as I say, <laughs> a few weeks down the line with um, further reflections on what I think is a very, very important topic, really for everybody to perhaps consider. Important for those who are not trans, perhaps if they could accept at least the possibility that this theory has something to it, then it should be possible, uh, I believe, to overcome a judgment and prejudice against those who find themselves as trans and, and not just rely on those, um, those old arguments about someone being misled um, or seeing the grass as always greener or there being something to do with their upbringing or their hormonal balance or whatever that is at root. And for some, indeed, seeing it as a psychological disorder um, and or a sexual perversion. I think many of us in Western society, at least, have moved on from those ideas in recent years, but they're, they're still there. So a very, very important topic. And one, I think, coming back to that title of that article that uh, set me really thinking about this, why isn't anybody talking about this? Um, a very, very valid question. We should be talking about our subconscious sex.